Hello. I want to talk about translation and its relation to bias. Now, the motivation for pressing the cue to go live is I was walking from a coffee shop and thinking about an article I read, really a, an essay from Soren Kierkegaard when he was in his mid to late 20s, writing about then a contemporary novelist, Hans Christian Andersen, no, 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 not Hans Christian Andersen, but someone with the last name Andersen, who wrote the story, the short story, what was considered then a short story, only a fiddler. And in this essay, Kierkegaard was caught it before it fell on the ground. Oh boy. In that essay, what Kierkegaard was doing, or what I think I was discerning him doing in that essay, rhetorically speaking, the rhetorical situation that I was finding in the text that gave a reason for the text was that Kierkegaard was practicing his scales. So before a person is a con concert pianist, they have to practice their scales at home with a teacher doing something repetitively at a low level, not for the sake of itself, but for the sake of the open-ended possibility or the open-ended future of their becoming a great piano player where their current ability is extended indefinitely to higher and higher scales and greater and greater compositions of those scales so that not only individually do the scales sound good, the way they put their finger on the key just is right, but the whole suite of the way they put their fingers on the keys makes a sound that is greater than the sum of its parts because you cannot reduce it to those fingers on the keys, but also it is indispensable or inseparable from those fingers on the keys at their location in time. And that technique, that exercise, that repetitiveness, the iterations, the, the hope and the prayer to be lifted up as it were out of the corruption of the here and now where taste does not meet skill level, that is something all artists share, but, but, broad, but artists broadly conceived, any person acquiring a skill or acquiring a state of character is in that path. So with that said, Kierkegaard in his later books, particularly the one that I am fond of, his composition known as Fear and Trembling, which I read when I was in college and still read to this day, this, am I too close? I don't want the laptop to fall again. That'll be fine. In the book, Fear and Trembling, he does a sort of exegesis of Abraham and Isaac and their walk to Mount Moriah, which for him is a scale for canvassing the argument of modus ponens, which is to say, given the premise if A, then B, second premise A, conclusion B. Very simple way of speaking. But that way of speaking actually is a translation of an invisible logic, an invisible way things come together, separate, come together and separate. The logi plural form of logic, the logical manner in which things stay 
and things go. That understanding of the way things are, if it will enter into a discourse, either for training, explanation, meditation, conversation, has to be translated into a target language that is not the original language. This is what mathematics is, a translation of a logic or suite of logics into a formal language with symbols that can be manipulated in order to show the underlying or background logic. And to fixate on the target language, forgetting the original language, is to have the fossil of the fish and not the fish in water. And I think this is why throughout many generations, different literatures will spring up, but they won't all survive. Because really what literature is, is a suite of pen to paper translations of the way things are as they are perceived to be, but also what the rhetorical situation demands of making intelligible, making sensible, making relevant the way things are to how they seem now. But the problem in our day and age, and this is the reason behind the reason I'm, I'm making this video now, the reason behind the reason is our day and age is obsessed with the cutting edge. When before we had this table and we were doing work on it with the saw, cutting the pieces of the wood or what have you to make something useful. Now it's all about what's falling off the edge, what's hitting the ground, what's falling, the splinters, the sawdust, Let's pay attention to all the minutia because somewhere in there is a, a minor, a minor major. But that's like someone on his way, his or her way to becoming a great concert piano player to repeatedly stop what they're doing at their scale or skill level and saying, Gosh, you know what? The cutting edge of piano playing right now is what these people are doing online with these music boxes, these sample sets, and it's all digital. There's no analogical finger on the analogical key. So why move the strings? Let me, let me look at what they're modulating and figure out why they're doing that, how they're playing with silence. And that's a recipe to distraction and irrelevance in the short term. And a, an aggravated craving for novelty. So I think we have to learn how to, how to be comfortable with being boring again. Hence the title of this video the sober rhetoric. Now I'll leave you with this image. I was reading a, an English translation of St. John Chrysostom's homily on the poor and the rich. Now St. John Chrysostom was a Christian in the fourth century. The saint that I'm named after at church. So when I go to church, I am addressed as John, my saint name, not not my, uh, my other name, Matthew. 
And that is why I am interested in St. John's life. I want to imitate what I admire in him as so as it were to compose myself accordingly. But with that said, as I was reading the translation, the English translation of one of his homilies, I turned back to the introduction, which was an introduction written by a monk. This translation of St. John was translated in a monastery. And one of the monks who helped in the translation of this text from the Greek to the English said what their philosophy was in so doing. And upon reflection, it is fascinating because he lifted the hood of the car to show me why the language in the translation was so formal, sober, no hiccups, no fizz and pop and heat, to use a phrase from, from professional wrestling. It was sort of boring to read. I mean, it was orderly, it was masterful in its balancing of phrases. And I knew in the back of my mind, as I was reading it, I could read this 10 years from now and it would still be stern, dignified, able, capable, reliable to get me where I needed to go. It might not be fun. It might not be the Audubon, but it was cruise control. This lofty, dignified, sober turn of phrase, which was an intentional decision on the part of the translator, as I said. Now, he, the monk was answering the rhetorical question, why did we go this route? Sometimes even changing the way St. John had said something, to lift it again, to lift it again, to lift it again. Why? And his answer was, because what St. John said was so valuable, our job as the translator was to do what we could to preserve as much of that as possible on the way from the original language to the target language. But not only that, to equip that target language with the right stuff to keep all that valuable value in St. John from decay, from rusting over. And one quick way to make your target language rustable is to fill it with fizz, pop, and curiosity. Just as jokes go stale after a year or two, curiosities and pyrotechnics, linguistically speaking, they lose their core and they are flattened and they don't last long in the rainstorm. The rainstorm of our attention span, the rainstorm of our cultural movements and rumblings and velocities and vectors. So numbered, stately, simple, almost non-equivocal language in the translation is what was opted for. And I think that's very instructive for our, again, for our age, which is so preoccupied with the cutting edge. And that's enough.